The Guardian. Hi, this is Paul McInnes, and you're listening to Music Weekly Extra from Guardian.co.uk. What's coming up is the full, unexpurgated interview between Tim Jones and Nicky Wire of the Manic Street Preachers. Enjoy. Richie took his art very seriously of writing lyrics, and a lot of them are lyrics. Something like William's Last Words was a page and a half of more like prose. But as a rule, it's just like it, like it was with the Holy Bible. It's quite awkward in the, you know, stanzas are... It's, you know, James's kind of Tommy Cooper moment, having a heart attack on stage, <laughs> as, you know, in pretension, repulsion or something. But then we went through all that with the Holy Bible, so... Um, no, I just felt a really um, exciting academic process, really. I mean, going back to, to kind of revisit, like... Richie's work and stuff well, why did you want to kind of go back to something that was quite traumatic at the time or did it not feel traumatic when you made the Holy Bible I know we thought about this a lot and um, it all goes down back to Send Away the Tigers really just kind of reaffirming ourselves and reconnecting with a new audience and, all. and you know it's a kind of glorious but somewhat straightforward rock album we don't pretend this is the most inventive thing we've ever done but it just made us feel it just made us fall in love with the band again I think that gave us the space uh, if we'd done this record after Lifeblood when we were at a kind of commercial low I think people might have accused us of uh, trying to salvage a career or that, you mm-hmm. know that kind of stuff but I think uh, Send Away Tigers gives a lot of confidence and I think if you look at us over the last three or four years there's just much more we haven't really talked about Richie for 10 years. We just thought, it's not right, you know, it's not tactful. We just keep it all to ourselves. And uh, I don't know, there's a certain kind of, um, there's a certain pride in just displaying kind of what I consider his amazing words. Mm-hmm. I just became a fan again of his words. And w- were you worried when, because, um, you know, the Sendaway Tigers had really re-established you mm. as kind of into the, the top flight or whatever they say. Were, were you worried, like, um, that by doing something like this was a bit of a risk and people might... There might be a bit of a backlash or anything like that. Yeah, definitely. And for once, it was Jim's ideas. You know, it's usually my ideas, which are the kind of suicidal, stupid ones, like going to Cuba <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> so when he said it in the back of the car, it was like, it was a bit of a relief, like I said, because I thought it was, he was coming up with something. And I think he, we didn't want to feel pressure to follow up Send Away Tiger straight away. We wanted to kind of sidestep the treadmill. Mm-hmm. And this is, dare I say it, much more an art project. Could you tell us a bit about the story of how you first came across the lyrics and wh- what you thought when you when you first read them? Yeah, well, Richie left... Um, it's hard to remember the exact time, but he left me a, a very beautiful ring binder with all collage, with photos, with pieces of art, paintings. And I think it was between five and sort of two weeks before he disappeared. At the time, we didn't really think he'd give facsimile copies to James and Sean. We didn't think it that strange because he was so prolific at that time. He was always working, he was always handing us stuff. I guess in retrospect, um, it was a much more important piece of work than, than we thought. But he was just so, at this point, he just was at some kind of creative arc where he just wrote about everything. And um, after he disappeared, obviously, it's just not something I felt really comfortable I've looked at it, I've looked at the paintings and the, the artwork that he did and the titles, which are brilliant, but I can't say I ever really studied the lyrics up, and, up until, you know, 18 months ago. And what, what did you think when you first kind of cast your eyes over them? Was there anything that stood out in particular? Yeah, it just straight away, really. That just kind of it made me realise straight away how much I missed him and kind of his fierce intellect and his ability to go to places that I could never go or I wouldn't want to go and that perfect symmetry we had as a band as a four piece even though we've had a lot more success since in commercial terms and done great records but that perfect symmetry we had it felt like god we can in a dreamlike sort of way we can almost get that back for for a year Mm -hmm. and um it it, it felt great it just felt like uh, I felt like we were making a, something of a tribute album. Because his family had said that, you know, he's presumed dead now. Yeah. Did, it, did that have a... No, I didn't. I mean, we decided quite a while, way before that, probably okay. a good six, eight months, I think, maybe even longer. And his family have got to do what they've got to do. I really support everything they do because they've got the kind of legal drudgery, shall we say, that they have to go through must be pretty... Well, it is. It's horrible. And, um, and in a lot of ways, they have it much, much harder than... Uh, than we do I think James was perhaps longing as well that Richie's lyrics pushes him to different places musically 
you know, mine are different. Mine are more. Richie probably couldn't have written "Design for Life," <laughs> you know, and I couldn't. I can't write these lyrics. So um, perhaps he just wanted to, to feel that random nature of. It pushes him to like John McGough guitars straight away. You could tell he just feels right. like a different beast. Because some of the lyrics. I don't know, I think people would assume that they were going to be really dark and depressing. Some of them are quite funny and some of them yeah. are quite surreal and quite quite odd, really. I mean, no, did that surprise you? It did initially, but after, you know, the person I knew, bar the last, sort of, say, the Holy Bible year, we should mm-hmm. call it, the person I knew before that was like that, you know, from playing football with him from the age of five onwards, going to university and, you know, he used to make me a fray bentos pie and chips. <laughs> Which is sort of surreal in itself in university and stuff like that, <laughs> and just sit around talking and listen to music. So, also I think these lyrics, um, like the the kind of rage and disgust of humanity of the Holy Bible, has somewhat subsided. And there's a sense of he's been through everything, he's doubted everything. Uh, the conclusions are not particularly happy ones, but I think he has reached some kind of calm on this record. I guess in a fatalistic way or. I don't know, it's not particularly pretty, is it? But uh, there is a sense that, right, I've gone through the process now, I kind of know, I know everything. I mean, Steve, Steve Albini, how was, how was that, working with him? Why did you want to work with him? For many reasons. One, that um, it is a pre-digital album. Mm-hmm. You know, Richie wrote these lyrics. He never had a mobile phone, he never had a, a laptop or a computer. So we wanted to record with Steve because he works with tape, it's all analogue, there's no computers, it's, you play live, which, you know, is probably a lot of bands you've interviewed who say yeah we, we recorded it live but they're just lying you know <laughs> so what, what are they doing I've done it as well you just record live and it goes into a computer and then you fucking fiddle with it right, you know? right, okay. but you don't do that with Steve it's just like put it on the tape and uh, that's why you can hear all the bits of feedback you can hear mics falling down it's just the way he does it so ethically we thought it was correct and mm-hmm. also Richie lived in utero and we did talk about using Steve Albini way back in 94 uh, and we liked a lot of his records. I mean, it was difficult. It was he, Steve doesn't give you many compliments. He doesn't pat you on the back. He can seem somewhat disinterested <laughs> at times. <laughs> we really enjoyed it. He was just uh, anyone who's, who's still kind of stuck to his guns, sometimes to his detriment, I think, in terms of his career. you just got to kind of admire. Because of the state of the world at the moment and the recession and all these things going on and being such a political band, did you actually think, well, actually, I really want to comment on all this so it's a bit strange not having the chance to write the lyrics yourself? Yeah, but, you know, I've got tons of lyrics written. You know, there's plenty there. and um, Give us a chance to look back as well. I remember I was looking at Generation Terrace and there's a track on there called Nat West Barclays Midlands Lloyds, which we literally used to get laughed at, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> really seriously laughed at for... And there's a brilliant line in there, Black Horse Apocalypse, Death Sanitized Through Credit. And um, that song actually seems so prophetic now. Um, and it is a kind of funny, it's us trying to be a metal band, you know. Nat West, Nat West Barclays Midland. <laughs> We've always been that band that our politics goes into our songs. It doesn't necessarily spill out into outside things, whereas other people that are into politics, supposedly, they never fucking write about it. I mean, get cape, wear cape, whatever. Mm-hmm. Fuck off with your cape and please <laughs> leave us alone. You know, he's never written a political song in his life. I don't understand that. Surely, if you are feel that way, you should be driven. I mean, the pain he's inflicted with his music is <laughs> nearly up there with bankers. <laughs> he's made me physically sick over the years. Well, whether it's Coldplay or U2, I mean, U2 don't write political songs anymore. They just don't. They do politics. Uh, so I just can't grapple with that. Are you still a fan of political songs? Yeah, it's the hardest thing to do. I mean, I've written some fucking terrible ones. It's the, to condense that without sounding like a dick. Mm-hmm. It is, you know, and I totally admit I've written some very bad ones. But something like Tolerate is a kind of perfect distillation of a... To actually write a pro-war song, that's pretty... Get number one. I don't know, there's something about Tolerate which I'm just innately very proud of. I know the early gigs would often descend into kind of a bit of chaos or... Yeah. Um, I mean, is there anything that stands out that you can kind of remember from the stage? Oh, yeah, I mean, phenomenal stuff, like in Garrock Bay, a place up in Scotland. Um, they were sh- shooting us with syringes, but the syringes were full of cider. <laughs> and they might have even been a compliment, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking burning my eyes, and Jim, and then someone punched Jim's. But it didn't. nothing felt bad back then, it always felt 
really exciting, like we were on a mission. At that first tour, we did the Motan Jung tour, and just staying in B&Bs and you know, sharing the same room together and uh, living in Shepherd's Bush with Philip, our uh, dear departed uh, manager. Incredible times for us, just coming from, from university and being exposed to the, to the whirlwind that was around us. And when there was things happening, I mean, being a sensitive soul, how did Richie kind of deal with kind of syringes and bottles? Uh, it, it was easy. It was, you know, we were on a mission. It was like we supported the levellers, and I was so angry. It just went insane. And went at this huge rant and said, you can all fuck off and walk your greyhounds now and come back in half hour <laughs> to the audience. Why we were supporting <laughs> levellers, I do not know. But, you know, it was like a fucking campfire in the gig, you know. They all had burners. They were making fucking pizzas in front of us. So. All that just it just bonded us. us. We were tight as friends anyway. But that just gave us such. And we were we were facing kind of praise and ridicule on a mm-hmm. kind of daily basis. When the band started out, Richie drove you around a lot, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I guess you kind of might not imagine that now. Kind of that he was kind of doing so much of the nitty gritty, the nitty gritty of stuff. So how, how was that? I mean, we we used to have a hired van. And we, my dad had an armchair from his shed that we used to literally put in the back of the van and tie to the edges. And I was like, James would sleep in a sleeping bag next to the amps in the back. And every time to London, we, we, we drove home every night, you know. So we'd leave the horse and groom at one in the morning and get home at five in the morning in this shitty transit. It wasn't an enemy-branded, you know, <laughs> shockwave tour for young and up-and-coming bands. It was... It didn't feel hard at the time, though. It felt just, like, really exciting. It was hard when I was doing my finals, trying to fucking do an essay on public administration after playing a gig in Salisbury with the levelers <laughs> or the family cat. That was, yeah, you know, that was... It did feel then like we were on the cusp of something, though, especially when we did the horse and groom over there and then Bob Stanley reviewed it for Maldi Maker. That, that, that was, like, a bit of a breakthrough. Making the Holy Bible was great. We, putting it out was brilliant definitely maybe was out park life but we made this fucking you know sort of post-punk masterpiece sort of splendid isolation but it, it did become a self-fulfilling prophecy and um those, those well, were i think faster came out i can't remember may something like that and from then on we went did those mad gigs in thailand i don't think we ever recovered really from thailand i think it was all downhill and that those last six months were were miserable uh, they, they, there's not much of that I can remember p- enjoying, apart from them smashing everything at the Astorias. So just just the grind of having too much work, was it? Well, it just Richie was. You could when you kind of feel you're losing someone that mm-hmm. you know so well. Just in, I don't even mean in a physical or mental state. Literally, that you can't communicate with someone that you've spent years writing at the table with, or just getting pissed with, or whatever, and you can see someone drifting out of your reach and you just can't kind of relate to them through no fault of their own and no fault of your own it's just it's the saddest thing really you just feel someone drifting away and it um, it was it was particularly stressful for everyone that that we did like a huge tour with Sweden, to Europe um, which just felt particularly brutal they were teetering on the edge as well right. and Bernard had just left and it ended up in some fucking airport in Munich just I think everyone was on the verge of cracking up really and it's just that thing of losing someone you kind of really know and love and you can see the eyes are just you're listening but you're not understanding you've probably talked about this to death but with the steve lamack interview mm. and and the you know the four real the mo- the moment that happened i was quite interested in what happened kind of after and where i mean did you laugh and joke about it a bit yeah <laughs> that's a fucking mad thing i went to the hospital with him and um I remember both of us at that point actually thinking, oh, fuck, we feel really guilty now because we're just abusing the NHS, really. Right. You know, we're taking the NHS for granted. And we were, Richie was really apologetic because he wasn't even pissed. You know, it's not like he was drunk or anything. So we, like the nurse, going, so how did, <laughs> how did this happen? You know, young man. And we had all the makeup on and, you know, in a hospital in Norwich. The gig, we'd only, there was only about fucking 20 people there and, I think that proved that it wasn't a publicity stunt that he, he did do it for real you know it's, it's not like there was any crowd there we were sat in casualty thinking oh, how are you going to explain this to the nurse and stuff but she was really really nice and the 
he got stitched up and we went back to the hotel in Norwich and um, just sat down and watched TV watch TV <laughs> he was in a lot of pain in the night all of a sudden it hit him that he'd chopped his arm and had 20 stitches as a band you've always been very into kind of the big rock and roll myths is there something quite awkward about the fact that Richie's become that to an extent he's become this thing that people talk about it's, it's been wrong for me to judge that because I we grew up I wouldn't say we celebrated that side but it's just something we were drawn to so um, the facts are that all the kind of personal memories I've got of him when he, he for instance he you know I was so given up on education he actually wrote quite a lot of my essays in my last year even though we were doing different courses or when we just you know walked to Cinderella Rockefeller nightclub in Swansea and danced terrible indie records <laughs> oh, like I said we used to play football um, he used to be like a flying winger or play cricket so all, I got so many images of him pre-band mm-hmm. um, that bear no relation to rock and roll mythology and also the idea you know when he disappeared he was driving a fucking Vauxhall Cavalier it was a service station on the Seven Bridge there's nothing glamorous about it it's just a human tragedy that people lots of people experience and um richie was he wasn't just a band member he's a friend you know he's someone's son someone's brother or you know whatever so there's a there's, there's a lot of kind of ripples of pain that came from his disappearance that have nothing to do with rock and roll myth and what and what what uh, marks did you did you get in your essays Oh, I would have. Well, no, Richie, I had better marks than the ones Richie did than my own. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was doing history and I was doing politics, and there was some crossover with the Second World War stuff, so uh, he, uh, yeah, I had better grades for I, I was totally. I, I, he was very disappointed to get a 2 1. I, I think he felt he should have got a first. He got three A's with his A levels. Right, I okay. got two A's and a B. So um, we were kind of. Uh, kind of weird that we ended up in a glam rock punk band <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what you could have been I think I would have been in the fucking foreign office, I was, I was kind of applying to go in the foreign office at the time so maybe I could have been like Malcolm in the thick of it or something <laughs> that would have been my dream role <laughs> Alistair Campbell maybe have you seen In The Loop? I haven't seen it yet, I've, I've kind of, I don't like I hate the cinema, I hate going it's to the horrible. cinema I just can't stand it so I'm waiting for it I, you know, I mean, I love the thick of it. It's just, it's just phenomenal comedy. The two specials, the rise of the nutters and stuff. I think unsurpassable. Yeah, I was a bit disappointed by the film actually. Yeah, I think everyone said that. Really? Yeah. All well, the reviews are like five stars, I know, brilliant. But, but everyone I know got it's, it's that thing of British comedy, very rarely translate to the big screen. You know, I think it's hard. On the buses, for instance. I was going to uh, go back to what you were saying about uh, Cinderella's, was it? Yeah. Just that I kind of like those kind of stories, the sort of small town going out, partying. Do you have any kind of memories of that? You can. Well, I mean, I mean, in university, for instance, not that I ever partook in this, but he in Rag Week and stuff like that, he, him and his two mates actually dressed up as seamen. They were just covered in white. I mean, you can't get any more student <laughs> if Ben Elton was doing it. <laughs> Absolutely, student stuff. And um, I like how you preface that with that. Obviously, I was nothing oh, to do with yeah, that. <laughs> it was way too cool, you know. I was, uh, <laughs> I was just going beyond that by then. And also, we used to go to this nightclub in in Port Talbot called Raffles to see kind of all C eighty six bands. We saw Tallulah Gosh there, and um, we saw My Bloody Valentine before they went kind of noisy. They used, mm-hmm. to have a, they used to have a boy singing. It was fantastic. The first two EPs are my favourite stuff by them. So we used to do that, but we, me, James, and um, and Sean could never get home. So we used to s- sleep in bin liners with the alcoholics of Port Talbot in this little circle by the river. But Richie always had an extra fiver or <laughs> an extra tenner. <laughs> and he was in uni at the time. I, I was about to go the following year, so... He'd always disappear off with his taxi and we'd be sleeping there in fucking bin liners, thinking, why have we came 50 <laughs> miles from Blackwood? But it was the only gig, really. It was the only place in Wales that was putting on those kind of gigs. How often did you do that? We did it about maybe six, seven times. Oh Went to see God. the wedding present, Darling Buds. Tilly the Gosh were brilliant. This, they were one of my favourite bands at the time. I'm always surprised by the bands you say you like. For some reason, I imagine you kind of anti a lot of these bands and then... 
I can't imagine being a big wedding person fan. I know. Just at that time, it was, it was just the enemy, and the C eighty six was really important to us. It, it just made you feel um, it was fanzine culture. It was slightly elitist, really. You know, it mm-hmm. was it was the real sound of the underground. I think, and it logically pushed you into different areas. And I think we felt we were just trying to find McCarthy was the big turning point for us. They were lumped in with C eighty six, but they weren't, and. Uh, we just came to the decision that musically we could never be that fey. Even though we loved the pastels and all that kind of stuff, shop assistants, it didn't suit us. We needed to be kind of cartoonish, coming from Wales and everything, which is so we had to be larger than life. Which I think Richie found a bit, bizarrely, he found that harder initially because he was a really studious kind of C86, desert boots, you know, that kind of mm-hmm. little jacket. Um, whereas we were on the way me in particular to becoming a more of a glamorous kind of thing he was always at the forefront of kind of reading something being inspired by it writing about it um, devouring it and then you know he had that side of him you know I'm stronger than Mensa Miller and Mailer a spat out platinum pinter kind of he'd like to he'd like to devour everything and then take the best bits and reject the rest and did, is, did this kind of huge broad cultural scope come from just being so into reading and yeah I think towards the end if I it's hard to say for sure but I think he just couldn't switch off at the end and um seemed like he was being inspired by everything to kind of create where he was either reading he was painting he was he was writing he was typing he was watching he was taking pictures it he kind of stopped being able to get to sleep um I kind of felt really sorry for him at that time because he just seemed like before he switch, he did have switch off time. We would watch films, we would watch sport. He would just get pissed and sort of pass out. But he stopped drinking by this time as well. And um, I, I really did. I, I, was, I just couldn't keep up with him. And he'd phone me up about stuff, and I just, I just was, didn't really know what he was talking about. His, his mind had, it, it had accelerated until the last kind of. Um, session we did together which uh, before he disappeared we did 10 days uh, I think it was 10 days and we did Small Black Flowers we did uh, No Service All Feeling Judge Yourself Uh, we just started Kevin Carter and a couple of other bits it was a really productive session and he seemed really really just happy is not the word but he just seemed like he was uh, 18 months earlier really seemed in a good place his kind of pathos was back and um, we just had a really productive uh, week or ten days, but then that was, a, that was the last time I saw it. For more great downloads, go to guardian.co.uk forward slash audio.